Okay. Well, let's go to, I got two passages of scripture that I want you to uh, look at. And everybody in the house, can you all praise God? Because there are thousands of people watching online that are not here from all over the world. To all of our online audience, God bless you. To Lighthouse Southeast, to Lighthouse South, and to Lighthouse West, God bless you. Um, we're definitely on the move. We got all of our campus pastors here. We got Pastor Hammond, Pastor Rama, and Bishop Roberts. Come on and praise God for them. Their wives are here. Uh, Lady Stephanie, and I tell you, uh, Ms. Hammond, when I, when I look at you, Marcia, I was just thinking, I was watching you walk in the hallway. I just want you to know that your courage is impeccable. I saw you out of the corner of my eyes. I was coming from a dream center, and I just thought, I was going to tell you privately, but I just looked at you now. Your courage is impeccable. And we pray the Lord will continue to keep you in perfect peace. Psalms 34 and 18. Psalms 34 and 18. Just one verse. If you ever get discouraged, memorize this one. Okay? See, you don't have to know the whole Bible. You just, need, you just need to hide a few scriptures in your heart. If you can't remember any other one, this is a good one to memorize when you're down. And I'm going to read it in English vernacular. You see it in the King James Version. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And he saves such as be of a contrite spirit. That means the more broken you are, the closer God gets. Some of us push God away because when you're broken and you're around people, you protect yourself and you take human characteristics and you put them on God. There are some people you need to keep away from when you're broken. But when you are broken, you can be vulnerable before God and you can tell him everything and he will not judge you. Can you say amen? amen? Go to Isaiah 61, verse 2, 3, and 4. Isaiah 61, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort, listen, all who mourn. Anybody mourning over anything? The loss of anything. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for the morning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. Look at verse 4. Planting of them, and they shall build the old waste. They shall rise up from the former desolation. You're going to rise up from former desolation. You're going to defeat that which defeats you. And they shall repair the waste cities, the desolate. And this is not just for you, but God says, what I'm doing for you, I'm going to do for many generations. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For those who need a subject, I just want to talk about how to heal. How to heal. You should take notes on this one. I don't, I don't intend to raise my voice unless y'all push me. I don't, I don't intend to do none of that. I'm going to lecture. Okay, is that all right? Can we, can we lecture today? Now, I know I'm going to offend some people in this first sentence, but I'm used to it. So listen, I am not a sci-fi seeker. I don't know nothing about Marvel. See, I'm already offending people. I don't even know what DC means in DC Comics. I really don't. I don't know if that's Washington DC Comics. I don't know. I don't, I can't, I couldn't name four Avengers. Don't judge me. You couldn't read four Bible scriptures. So what you judging me for? I know what I know. You know what you know. <laughs> Judge, judgmental Christians, boy, I tell you. I don't, I don't know anything about it. I don't have an appetite for it. I don't think I've ever owned a comic book. I don't, I don't know them. But 
Obviously, somebody does because they'd have made a lot of money, billions of dollars on these franchises. And um, so I, I don't know how, I don't know if, if Iron Man is, a, is an Avenger or if the Incredible Hulk is related to Superman. I, I really don't know how all of that works. Um, but one thing I know about all of them is they all have a weakness. Some are more powerful than others. But I do know through experience that all of them have some sort of weakness. I know that Iron Man um, is vulnerable to sonic waves. I, I, I do know that much. I know that much. Um, I know that if He-Man uses too much strength, then he goes back uh, to being human. I know that um, if the Black Panther doesn't have the heart-shaped herb, I know that he's a mere mortal, and everybody knows that Superman's weakness is kryptonite. Everybody, no matter how strong you are, everybody has a weakness. Every one of you. Now, I know you don't want us to know it, and that's what we do. We hide our weaknesses so that we don't uh, avail vulnerability but everybody in here has something that will break you all the way down. And I don't care how strong you pretend to be. Listen, you have a place where your powers don't work. Oh, let me, let me, let me say this too. The Holy Spirit just gave me this. Not only do you have a place where your powers don't work, you will eventually meet somebody that your powers don't work on. <laughs> Everybody in here. Now, if you would ask somebody in here next to you, say, what, what is your weakness? They would probably struggle to tell you. It's not that they don't know, it's that they don't want to reveal it. Ask them what their strength is, they got a list. Well, I can do, I can do, I can do, I can do. I can cook, I can, I can. But, but what can't you do? Everybody, everybody, everybody say everybody. everybody. Everybody has a place where the powers don't work. And typically, your biggest opponent in life is you. Like I said, I don't know much about it, but I know the hardest I ever seen Wolverine fight was when he was fighting himself. Because what do you do when the thing you fight has the same weapons that you have. And what do you do when you come up against something in you that in order to fix it, you have to harm yourself? So whenever there is something that needs to be fixed in us and we realize how much pain it will take us to get over that trauma, we back off of fixing ourselves and try to fix everybody around us so that we can stay the same and judge everybody else for not changing. Touch your neighbor and say, it's tight, but it's right. Now, it's going to be rough in here today. It's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. The same is true of the subject of our text. David was a strong fellow. He was so strong that he killed a bear barehanded, no pun intended. He killed a lion with his own hands. Took a slingshot, hit a giant in the center of the forehead, cut his head off, and took it back to his mama. Dropped it on her doorstep and said, you should have kept him at home. He defeated more armies and more people than you could shake a stick at. And yet, with all of the strength and power that David possessed, I would surmise and submit to you 
that although he was strong militarily, although he was strong financially, although he was strong in his reputation, he was possibly one of the weakest men we've ever met in the Bible. And it is not because of where he was born, but it was because of who he was born to. And David, amongst all of the strongest men of the Bible, was probably one of the most traumatized men you've ever not met. And it did not start in high school where we pretend our trauma starts. And it did not start in our first marriage where we pretend our trauma starts. And it did not happen after you got fired from the job. His trauma started in his father's house. Where when he was with his brothers and the prophet came to the house to see who would be anointed next. His father had all of his brothers in the lineup, but somehow didn't think that his youngest son, David, or his son, David, uh, was suitable for the position. So he left David out in the field while he tried to push his other sons on the prophet to pick somebody to, 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 to supplant Saul. And David is out in the field looking through the windows, looking at Samuel look at his brothers and find out if their shoulders are broad enough and find out if they're tall enough and to see if their countenance is strong enough. And here David is out in the field smelling like sheep dung, tending sheep, not even invited by his father into the house. And then when you look at all of the things that David does in his life, you understand that it did not come as a result of what happened after he became king. It is a result of what happened when he was a kid. And one of the things we do not like to do is go revisit our childhood. Not only do you like to not revisit your childhood, you are raised by baby boomers who don't like to revisit the past. Oh, come on, y'all. Now, y'all came out here. No sense of being quiet. So, so now you are raised by somebody who says what goes on in this house stays in this house. You're raised by somebody who won't allow you to speak to them about trauma. You're raised by somebody who doesn't want to hear what you have to say. Why? Because when they tried to speak on theirs, they were shut down. And now when your children cry, you tell them to shut up. And here we are speaking about generational curses, and we are the captains of the cycle. So it is possible then for you to become a king and be insecure. It is possible for you to have 12 employees and still have anxiety. It is possible for you to be the smartest person in your family. It's possible for you to be beautiful because David was a handsome man. It is possible for you to have a Birkin bag. It is possible for you to have a Louis Vuitton belt. It's possible for you to drive a Bentley and a Rolls Royce and still not believe in yourself. Because let me tell you something, you can't outdress trauma. No. There ain't no BBL can help you to get over what's going on in your heart. I don't care how, butt, how big your butt get. If you don't enlarge the size of your heart and your mind, there are no extensions or eyelashes. I don't care if they're mink or out of Walgreens. I don't care if they're put in individually or they come in strips. There's no amount of cash, no amount of pit bulls, no amount of glasses, no amount of dogs, no amount of houses. There is nothing that can get you over what's happening on the inside of you. All you will do is dress up your trauma and not be long from exploding on somebody, which is why I never recommend that two broken people get together because it won't be long before you cut each other. Let's touch your name and say, we're going to learn how to heal. We're going we're gonna to learn how to heal. Shopping therapy isn't a thing. Have you ever noticed that you go to the mall, you put something on in the dressing room, it looks good, but when you get home, you don't like the way it looks? Because after you finish coping, you're going to be broke. And it gets you right back into the cycle. Is this worth anybody here so far, if I'm talking to you? And anybody who didn't raise your hand, tell your neighbor, say, it's really for you because you're the one he's talking to. You're trying to, act, you're trying to act like it's for somebody else. I don't even want you thinking about who's supposed to hear this sermon. If God wanted them to hear it, they'd be here. But guess who is? Trauma. Trauma. And we refuse to deal with it.
We blame people. I did that because you yelled at me. If they didn't look at me that way, then I wouldn't have acted that way. Or, well, I yell because my mama used to always yell at me. I, you know, I'm, I'm, or, or the opposite, the opposite, we go the other way and we are there for our children in ways we feel that our parents were not there for us, still acting out of trauma. You should not be a good parent because you had a bad parent. You should be a good parent because being a good parent is the only kind of parent to be. But whenever you use trauma as a motivating force, then you get mad at people who don't appreciate it. Y'all yeah. don't want to talk to me. Y'all don't want to talk to me. See, whenever you do something as a result of trauma, then you get angry with people who don't accept it, and then you say stuff like this, well, I just ain't going to do it no more. Or you ain't say sorry to me, I ain't apologizing to you no more. You ain't speak to me when I came in the house? Tomorrow I plan to walk right past you. I'm on the car like, he better not say nothing to me because I'm walking right past him. He ain't say nothing to me yesterday. I ain't got to say nothing to him. And I wish he would say something to me because what I'm going to say is, well, yesterday you didn't. I'm going to holler at your boy, man. Everybody say trauma. trauma. Say it again. Say trauma. Trauma. trauma is disrespectful. Trauma don't care if you're Latino. Trauma don't care if you're black. Trauma don't care if you're white. Trauma don't care if you're rich. Trauma doesn't care if you're poor. Trauma doesn't care if you're self-employed, underemployed, overemployed. Trauma don't care nothing if you're a Christian or Muslim. It don't care if you're agnostic. It don't care. Trauma will hop on your back and make you think about swallowing a bottle of pills and leaving your five-year-old in the bedroom without a second thought. At the moment you have the most on your shoulders, Somebody say, I want to heal. I want to heal. Can I tell you what Jesus said in John 16? Just so, because you know a lot of people, how many people know people like when they go through stuff, they like, they shocked that stuff fell apart. Like, oh my God, I, I went to church yesterday. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Where they do that at? That ain't, that ain't how that works. That's not how that works. That's not how that works. John 16 says, I tell you this so that you can have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Jesus is literally saying to us, I want to tell you up front that you're going to go through stuff so you won't fall apart when you go through it. What I want you to understand in this next season of your life is you're going to have to learn how to go through things without letting things go through you. Somebody say, learn to conquer it. Somebody say it. Say, conquer it, conquer it. I'm going to give you three things you need to do every time trouble knocks on your door. Are you ready? Expect it, embrace it, and then exceed it. Every time trouble comes, be like, okay, I knew you were coming. And trouble's not looking for you to embrace it. It's looking for you to fight it. So what do you do with somebody who wants to argue that you refuse to argue with? See, you embrace it. You disarm. Because watch this. The enemy already anticipates what your reaction will be to the trouble, so he only has a plan for his anticipated reaction to your typical reaction. But when you get into a season where you do something different than people expected you to do, you defeat and defuse the enemy. They expected you to cuss and you smile. They expected you to go on Instagram and you ignored them. They expected you to make up a lie and you act like they didn't exist. The enemy doesn't have a plan for an opposite response so the best way to deal with the enemy is not to do you it's to find the new you because he has no strategy for the person you haven't become uh, touch three people and say I'm about to do something different with my life not only am I about to do something different with my life, I'm about to have different people in my life. I'm about to be around people who do not push me to act a fool. I need to be around people who can reel me in and calm me down. I need some people who won't judge me for who I was, but will not let me stay who I am. Do I have anybody in here? Uh, 
Everybody say, expect it, embrace it, exceed it. Embrace it, exceed it. Expect it, embrace it, exceed it. Over and over and over again. Guess what's going to happen tomorrow? Some stupid stuff. And guess what you're going to do? Expect it, embrace it. Guess what the devil going to do in September? Some dumb stuff. What you going to do? Guess what's going to happen at Thanksgiving when all your crazy cousins get together? Matter of fact, some of y'all need to sit down and tell your kids right now, all right, now Willie Earl crazy, he's going to ask you for $20. Don't bring no money because if you ain't got none, you can't give it to him. Expect it. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't understand the decisions you make. And I've never understood how people can have an issue with your decisions but won't nobody to have any with the ones they made. <laughs> Expect it, embrace it, and exceed it. Are you listening to me? So the next time your job tell you we downsizing, You, you're going to break down because you lost your job or are you going to take it as a sign that God says, I've been telling you that you're an entrepreneur the whole time. I've been telling you to start your business the whole time. Okay, so you won't leave the job. I'm going to make the job leave you. Expect it. Embrace it. Exceed it. As strong as David was, as much real estate as he owned. Could you imagine what David's closet looked like? So y'all not using your imagination. Can you imagine how much regalia? How many ephods and robes David had in his closet? Could you imagine? He's, he's the king of Israel. He's got everything, all of the chariots, all of the horses. And despite an expensive budget, and despite, he gave a billion dollars to start building the temple. Then, the, John Rockefeller wasn't the first dude balling. David was. David was so rich that his son became the richest man the world ever saw. And yet, He had trauma. Yet, as a battle-tested warrior, he still got Uriah killed to be able to take advantage of his wife. I can only imagine that he only wanted Bathsheba because he thought that she wanted him, and because his father didn't want him, David would go in the direction of anything that wanted him. No wonder he took the abuse from Saul, because at least Saul sometimes acted like he wanted him. Thank you. You ever wonder why he stuck around? Look at the trauma. He's so traumatized that he refuses to kill a man who tries to kill him every time an evil spirit takes over him. He's got everything in the world. He's the most famous man, the best king that Israel has ever had. And yet he admits, to his, he admits to his depression in our text in Psalms 34 and 18. He says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I wonder if I can get anybody online in this room to just admit just today, Pastor, I'm smiling, but I'm crushed. I got on my my best clothes, but I'm, but I'm crushed. I drove to church today in a new car, but I'm crushed. I know I'll be telling everybody, I don't care. Truth is, I'm crushed. And I've been going to church so long, I just, I just learned how to fake it. I got my church face, but I got my home face. I know how to smile when everybody's looking, but the truth is, is when I'm in the home, 
by myself. The truth is, is it is I came out amongst all of y'all today. Somebody saying, but the truth is, I ain't want to be here. I just felt something telling me, you got to go, you got to go. I felt the Lord saying, I got to go. I felt a tug, but I was crushed. I felt a pull, but I was crushed. David said, my emotions are like pieces of glass shattered on the ground. In fact, like a mirror shattered all over the place. And when I see my reflection, I just see my pieces. I've built walls because of my ex. I've closed doors because of my current. I ain't no real people in here. I can't stand preaching to fake people. I really can't. I really can't. I, I, I'm, I'm too busy to come here for y'all to be looking at me like, like you built walls because of what happened. You closed doors because of what is happening. You isolated yourself because you don't trust nobody. And the truth is, you have problems with the person you're in relationship with, but they're not the problem. The problem is you are really in relationship with the person you're no longer in relationship with. And so now you've built some boundaries to ensure that the person who you are with doesn't hurt you like the person you left. But my question for you is, is why would you build any rules on somebody you're no longer with? Touch your neighbor and say, if you can't say man, say ouch. You can't accept love because you're insecure. <clears throat> you doubt yourself because you have guilt. Instead of picking up the pieces and confronting your dysfunction, you get loud and fight. How many ever seen anybody just fighting and wrong? Just just wrong, just screaming. I know I'm wrong, but you ain't got to look at me like that. What? How many of y'all ever heard people make dumb rules because they don't want to be wrong? Who's, who's this for? Who's this for? Who is this for? Show me, show me if, I'm talk, if I'm talking to anybody here today, because I know I don't come for everybody. I just came for somebody. Who is this for? Just show me in sections, because I, I, I don't like this sprinkle stuff. Is it? Am I talking to anybody over here? Because see, by the time I finish with some of y'all today, you're going to find out now it's your season to be a wife. You just, you didn't know that God was trying to work some things out. And you've been wondering why things have been passing you by. It's because you were not emotionally ready for what God had for you. But by the time we get finished today, you're going to start to see blessings coming down and falling in your lap. And things are going to start working together because now you are not just getting ready for what you want, but you are ready for you, what you want and what you want is ready for you. And what a beautiful collision when you ready for it and it is ready for you. Slap your neighbor and say, I'm walking into my season of expectation. I'm walking into my season of better. I'm walking into my season of more than enough. I'm walking into my season of what I deserve. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. You can't even fathom what God is going to do in my life. Now, if your neighbor ain't said nothing to you yet, it's probably because they're jealous of a future they haven't seen yet. I need you to look your neighbor right in the eye and say, listen to me. God can do for you what he can do for me. So we might as well praise him together. I'm going to praise him for you and you're going to praise him for me. I'm going to give him glory for you and you're going to give him glory for me. I prophesied that your latter days are here. I prophesied that old things are passed away and all things are about to become new. I prophesied the trauma is about to melt away. I speak in the name of Jesus that by the time you walk out of this door, God is going to make your trauma make sense to you. If you believe it, make some noise in this place. Slap somebody say, I'm tired of picking wrong. I'm tired of crying at night. I'm tired of scrolling on Instagram, looking at everybody else, and I'm ready to walk into my season. I'm ready to walk into my appointed time. I'm ready for my destiny. If I'm talking to you, you better act like it and shout in this place. Somebody shout, I'm ready to be vulnerable again. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. Don't say it if you don't mean it. I'm willing to be hurt again. 
Listen, because if you ain't willing to be hurt, you can't be loved. I can guarantee you anybody who loves you will hurt you. No, the Bible says those whom he loves, he chastises. Hurt is not the absence of love. Sometimes hurt is correction. And you better learn the difference between hurt and correction. Anybody who has authority over your life has the right to hurt you for the correction's sake. Ask your children how bad you hurt them. If hurt doesn't mean love. Oh, you quiet now, huh? That's different. Tell me how. I'll shut up. Come up here and tell me. It's amazing how we understand authority when it's going out. And how stupefied we become when authority comes in. We know how to exercise authority, but we don't know how to submit to it. Thank you. And I'm trying to heal you because... Wounded people can't provide enough stability to ease pain. And let me tell you something. It is in my experience that there are some things that you hurt too long about. Some stuff don't take that long to get over. Unless you have found a way to benefit from sympathy. Do I need to come down there and fight every one of y'all? I told you I ain't scared of y'all. Y'all keep playing with me, I will fight every one of you. You cannot spend the rest of your life getting over high school. Or go back and get in high school and relive those four years or move on. I am confused at how people can graduate school but can't graduate in life. So you got out of your doctorate program, but you're still in pre-K emotionally. And then, because you got the clothes, the cars, and the houses, you find another boss like you, only to find out that you are a boss on the outside only. and no emotional intelligence on the inside. And when you don't have that, you not only can you not be a good spouse, you're not emotionally strong enough to be a good friend. There is nothing worse than thinking you are sharing your secrets with somebody who is emotionally stable only to find out that that friend was a secret agent who betrayed you for their own endangrisement. Let me get back up here, because. When I come down, that stuff just start coming out of my mouth. Yeah, I'm gonna come back down there because what we do, yeah, I just felt like it today. We put on our mask and we sell a fake version of ourselves and then get mad at people when they find out who we really are. So what was I supposed to do, stay stupid? When I found out who you were, I treated you accordingly. Now we all know who we are. Can't we all just get? God will never bless who you pretend to be. And the church above all has become a crowd of plastic fakers. Pretending we all got a word for the Lord. My question is, if you have a word from the Lord, why ain't that word working in your house, in your life, on your finances, and in your ministry? It's because you are broken, and you need to be broken long enough to heal and stop climbing over all of your wounds. You need to talk about it. You need to live through it. You cannot change what you don't acknowledge. 
Tell somebody, I'm trying to get over this stuff. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of being negative. I'm tired of not liking myself. I'm tired of messing up good relationships. I'm tired. I'm tired. I want to heal. Can I tell you something? That was the introduction. I'm going to go fast. I promise. I'm going to be on. If I have online in this room, if I have described your life in any way, raise your hand. Are you ready for the first point? You ready? Don't worry about it, though. He's close to the broken heart. You won't find God near the people who don't identify with what I just said. The more broken you get, the closer God comes. Oh, you missed what I just said. See, as long as you keep walking around here, I got it, I got this, I got this, I don't need nobody, I got this, God says, okay. I need thee. Every hour, leaning on your everlasting arm. And every time you admit it, God is getting closer to the broken heart. Just tell your neighbor, can you feel that? That's my Jesus getting closer. Because I got my heart literally on my sleeve. I'm in this atmosphere saying, God, I ain't got it together. Don't know what to do next. Don't know where I'm going. It's not my father, not my mother, not my sister, not my brother. But it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Is there anybody in here that will break your alabaster box so that God can smell the aroma of your trauma and say, God, I need you in this season of my life? I said I wasn't going to do that. He is literally near those who are crushed. Okay, L let, me, let me give you the Hebrew word for crushed. Y'all ready? The Hebrew word crushed is literally translated, listen to this, weighed down by something I can't get rid of. How many of y'all got that, that weight? It's like a boomerang every time you throw it. Every time you think you're over it, somebody say something to make you know that gorilla's still down in there. Huh? You done went to therapy and you thought you had that monster under control. But when you got in that grocery store and they acted like they didn't want to help you, and you went to McDonald's and you asked for ketchup and they left it off, Oh, you ain't never seen nobody mad until you go to a restaurant and they order their food and it didn't come the way they ordered. They yell at the waiter like he made it. <laughs> then you have to ask yourself, are you mad that they didn't put ketchup on it or are you upset because something else let you down? Because when you get that mad about ketchup, it ain't about ketchup. It's that you didn't get something else that you expected. Somebody say he's close. How many of y'all love somebody so much that when they are close to you, you get happy? All right, now, you don't, don't go too far in here now. Just, you know, see, it's church, still church. E. <laughs> Not your typical, so I guess you can, but I'm just saying. It's like, it's like knowing that somebody you love is about to come around the corner. <laughs> and his wife on the second row just looking like, ah. Oh. All right, y'all behave, Tammy and Sarge, y'all behave. And it's, it's, like, it's like waiting on somebody who you love and you've only talked to them on the phone for six months and, and you know they're on the plane and they text you, we about to land. Oh, some of y'all don't know nothing about that, huh? 
I remember when my wife lived in California, she, really, she used to call me. We used to, we used to talk on the phone so much, we would FaceTime eating. Not even talking to each other, just. <laughs> just waiting. God says, can you feel me close? Because the only way I can fix your wounds is close. I can't, I can't bandage you up from a distance. I can't put a Band-Aid on from across the street. I can't put sutures in your skin from across the state. I've got to be close. See, the best thing you can do in this next season of your life is just go ahead and admit to God where you're broken. And we, we ought to have a, a church where... People can come here with all kind of issues and just lay it on the altar, cast it on the altar, and not have to worry about being judged, right? Am I, am I talking to anybody? Anybody want to go to church like that where you don't have to, people looking at you like, I can't believe she wore that. And the only difference between you and them is you wear it, you just don't wear it here. No, before you can judge, it, it can't be in your closet. That part. Touch your name and say, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. You might got a long skirt, but you got weed on the coffee table right now. Huh? Tell the camera people, don't, don't show nobody, don't show nobody. Keep it, keep it on me. And, so, and so, so when we look at this, God says, I, I'm, I'm close to the brokenhearted. I want to be around the people who nobody else wants to be around. I want to be around the people who are robbing Peter to pay Paul. I want to be around the people who are one month away from being evicted. I want to I I get around people who can't seem to feel love even when they have love. I want to be around people whose hearts are broken even when they swear it's been mended. I need to be around people who had children but can't seem to love children. I need to be around people who have a spouse but wish they were single. I want to be around people. Who can tell me their secrets and trust me not to tell anybody about it. How many know you can trust God? God heals the brokenhearted. Touch three people and say, he's close, he's close, he's close. And for those of y'all he isn't close to, he's coming. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The first thing Jesus tells us is that there is an anointing on his life. That's what he says in Isaiah 61. That's the first thing he tells us. There's an anointing on my life. Everybody declare this with me. There's an anointing on my life. That simply means that God has picked you to do something that nobody else in the world can do it. So if you don't do it, it can't get done. Somebody say, I'm anointed. I want you to hear that and get that in your spirit because the anointing is just not for the pulpit. Jesus was upset because he anointed disciples and they could not cast out demons. Some of you all in this room and online, you are anointed, but you don't exercise the anointing because you think it is a spooky thing that only ministers have. You have a purpose and an anointing on your life that is specific to you and nobody else has that anointing. Do you, do you hear what I'm telling you? Somebody say it again. Say, I'm anointed. So the first thing he says is that I'm anointed. But here is, the second thing he says is not only am I anointed, but I am here for a purpose, and that is to bring good news to the poor. It doesn't say he came to the rich. It doesn't say he came to the famous. It didn't say he came to the religious. It said that he came to the afflicted and the poor. Here's what God is saying. He says, church, I want you to understand my main audience is those who need me. 
I wish I could preach this on a channel where every church person in the world heard it because some people think that Jesus is just for church people. Go back and read your Bible. You ain't never seen Jesus walking around with a group of church folk nowhere. He said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. You saw Jesus with prostitutes. You saw Jesus with all kind tax collectors eating in their house. He says, I came that you may have life and have it more abundant. I seek that which is poor in spirit. My main audience is people who've been bleeding for 12 years and nobody else wants. You'd be surprised how many people would come into church if we opened the doors and let them in and stop acting like it is only for those who already know him. Because my question for you is, isn't it true that there was a time that you did not know him yourself? He says, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you, and I don't care what nobody else has to say about it. I love you just the way you are. And I got a Holy Spirit that I will set up as a resident president to transform you. But until then, it's you and me. It's you and me. He says, I know you so well. I know how many hairs you have on your head. And me who ain't got none. He knows how many I lost. You'd be surprised how much God knows about you. How much he cares about you. How much, how much he loves the part of you that you keep trying to hide. How much he loves the part of you that you don't put on the resume. How much he loves that you don't introduce to people. God says, no, you're messing up our relationship. I thought I was getting that. Because I want to make all things new. And I'm tired of hooking up with people who want me to believe everything is new. I need people to come to the altar and fall out and say, Lord, if you don't help me, I can't stand it. I can't, I can't help it. I can't hold my peace. Paul says, I want to do good, but evil is always present, and, and, and I'm perplexed on every side, and I'm, I've got trouble, and, and, and I've, got, I've, got, I've got broken pieces. I've been bitten by a snake. A few times they stoned me and left me for dead, and yet I still trust you. You got to admit it if you're going to heal. You got to stop coming here toting your Bible verses and pointing your Holy Ghost nose at people and your righteous finger at people. And you got to come in here and you got to come prostrate and lay yourself out on this altar. Let me move on. God says, I've been sent here to bind up the brokenhearted. I've come to bring liberty to the captive and freedom to prisoners. I don't know who this is for, but the Lord told me to put it in your spirit. God says, I and moving this ministry into a season and a place of two things, healing and freedom. Yes, yeah. Yeah. High five your name and say, I'm healing your freedom. I'm healing and your freedom. I promise you, if you don't quit, if you don't give up, if you don't throw in the towel, you're about to walk in healing and freedom. The kind of freedom that says, yeah, I did it, but I'm still saved. Yeah, I was there, but I'm still here. You can say whatever you want about me, but God loves me just the way I am. And if I lose you, I ain't lost nothing, because as long as I got Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Can I have everybody in the room just start shouting, healing and freedom, healing and freedom, healing and freedom, healing and freedom. Write this down. God says, I'm about to invade three areas of your life. I'm about to invade three areas of your life. I'm about to invade your heart. I'm about to invade your home. And I'm about to invade your habits. I'm telling you, that's what he told me. I'm getting ready to invite myself into your home, your heart, and your habits. And I'm going to get in there and I'm going to break up this guilt. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm coming to break up the hurt. 
the parking lot over here on the left side? Some of y'all parked on it today. Who parked on the blue lot over here on the left? Now, any of y'all who don't know, uh, about two months ago, that parking lot had to be demoed and reconstructed. And the reason why it had to be demoed and reconstructed is because the infrastructure was crushed by the weight of what was on top of it. So the water was backing up. And if you had been over here in the last couple months, we were calling out here, we would call it Lake Lighthouse. How many of y'all saw all of that water accumulating there? Because it didn't have the infrastructure to flow to the runoff and go where it was designed to go, so it backed up. Now, we had two options. We could have left it there and just act like it wasn't fair. Or we could go through the trouble of breaking up what was on top to fix what was on the bottom. I'm going to challenge some of y'all. Because you can't keep doing landscaping on your life. If you are ever going to heal and get in the flow of what God has for you, you're going to have to break up what you built. Listen, that means sometimes it's going to cost you twice as much to build your life because you're going to have to break up what you paid for and then pay for the new season. My question for you is, are you willing to break up your cuteness Are you willing to break up your presentation? Are you willing to break up what you've convinced us you are so that you can get your infrastructure together and get in the flow? Aren't you tired of living beneath your privilege? Well, God said, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. If you are in here today and you are a believer in Christ, he came that you may live abundantly. Anybody in here sick and tired of living beneath your promise? Watch this. We had the water over there. Pastor Terry, we had all kind of ducks and birds over there in the water. Because when your life is broken, you will attract what needs it. There are no birds over there now because it's fixed. When you fix your life, that which is uninvited will fly away. And because we are near the airport, we have to fix it expeditiously because airplanes land on the runway and, and the birds are a hazard to the plane. So sometimes your broken life is a hazard to an innocent person. My inability to fix the mistake could cost somebody their life. I had to not only fix it for us, I had to fix it for people I would never meet. You've got to smooth out your rough edges so you stop cutting people who didn't expect to bleed when they brushed up against you. It is not okay to be that mean. It is not okay to hold a grudge for nine years. It is not okay for you to still be mad at your ex. They've been married twice since you left them. And got six kids. And you still talking about what happened when they were there? If it was going to consume your conversation, you should have stayed. If you have the courage to walk away physically, then the next step is to have the courage to walk away emotionally. Let somebody say, fix what's underneath. God says, I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. Ooh, I almost shouted when I read that. 
rocks. I'm going to give you beauty for ashes. I'm going to give you the oil of joy. I'm going to give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. In other words, he says, man, I'm about to exchange all that pain. You're going to be so happy, you ain't going to even be able to explain it. You're going to be, you're going to wake up happy. You're going to go to bed happy. And let me tell you something. Get ready for this. The happier you get, the more you will irritate people who are unhappy. And let me tell you something. Don't you calm yourself down to make them happy. I need everybody in here to declare this with me say I refuse to water myself down because they can't handle me at a hundred proof I'm gonna say it to somebody over here you're gonna have to take all of this this smile this happiness I refuse to walk around here sad because you can't get yourself together I'm just looking for people who got the joy of the Lord who got the joy of the Lord I'm not even going to calm this sermon down for people who don't want it like this I'm gonna give it to people who are on the same frequency I'm on Give your neighbor a high five and say, I got to exchange this energy with you. When I move, you move just like that. If I jump, you jump just like that. If I shout, you shout just like that. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he will do for you. Now, I need a 100 people in this room to open up your mouth and begin to give God glory because he's about to take the hurt away. Tell your neighbor, I can't even feel it no more. I don't even know who I was mad at. I don't remember what we were arguing about because I've cast that care into the sea of forgetfulness. You got to lay aside every weight. Did you know that it's impossible to praise God and still stay heavy? Nah. Anybody in the church is still downtrodden and heavy is because you won't release yourself to give him glory. You cannot stay down when you lift up your voice. You can't stay down when you lift up your hands. You can't stay down when you lift up your spirit. When praises go up, people go up too. I want you to open up your mouth right now and begin to give God the kind of glory that signifies I once was lost but now I'm found. I used to be depressed, but now I'm going to the next level. Come on and give him glory. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and see if you can find a praise partner. Find somebody who will shout with you for the next 30 seconds. Find you somebody who will shout with you for the next minute. Find somebody. I said I wasn't going to do it. I said find somebody. I said find somebody. Some of y'all ain't found nobody yet. I said find somebody and tell them neighbor, God told me to tell you, oh, all oh, things are, are passed away and all things are about to become new. If you feel the newness of God all over your life, I dare you start shouting right now. I dare you lift up your heads, oh ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this king? I said I wasn't going to do that. But you know, the church is always preaching about how God gets glory out of our suffering. But God also gets glory out of your healing. I decree and declare you will not walk with your head like this. Over the next few years, you will not be walking around here concerned because somebody didn't speak to you. I want you to praise right past the joker that didn't speak to you. Matter of fact, if your neighbor ain't said nothing to you yet, I dare you scream until you irritate them. And if they looking at you like you ain't supposed to praise God, tell them, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I had to go through just to get here. Is there anybody in the room that's been laying by the pool of Bethesda for 30, 80 years? But the word of the Lord is, the angel is troubling the water. Tell somebody there's a miracle in the room and it's got my name on it. There's another miracle in the room, and it's got your name on it. But if you don't want it, I'll take it. 
If you don't want it, just give it to me. Shout it yeah. First Peter 5 and 7, cast your cares on him. Okay? He didn't say keep them. He said cast them. Any, uh, whenever we go out of town, uh, my wife and I, some of y'all might be like this, we got shows that can't nobody watch unless we're together. Okay? She got a little shows she can watch on her own but she better not watch Lincoln Lawyer without me. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. She better not do it. Okay. No, no. She, you know, she, she, she can go to the, to the cooking channel and watch them bake some cakes. Uh, but 1883 is for her and I. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Okay. We got shows we got to watch together. Now, although we have those shows that we watch together, I refuse to take my Hulu account to another TV because ain't nobody going to be watching my stuff while I ain't there. Okay? I ain't signing in nowhere. <laughs> but she don't mind. She signs in because she's perfected the art of Google Chromecast. She don't have to sign in on a device. She signs in on this and she cast it. And, and here's the greatest thing about it. When she cast it, it gets bigger. She could do mo like most of us and keep it, but anything you keep will always be small. If you ever get enough courage to just cast it, you would see how much God could do with what you have enough courage to give him. Cast it. The volume is louder over there. The picture is bigger over there. I can see details over there that I cannot see over here, and as long as you keep hoarding your trouble, you will always stay small. If you want to grow, when is the last time you ignored somebody who said, give me your bills? I'll pay them. No, I want to pay my own bills. Ask me right now. I, just ask somebody, ask me. Somebody just come up and say, Pastor, I want to pay your bills. Come here, I'll show you how to do it. I ain't going to have to pray about it. Because I expect it. I embrace it. And I exceed it. <laughs> how to heal. First, just cast it. Give it to him. Number two, we're going home. Confess it. Stop. Don't sit down. I'm done. Don't stop <laughs> pretending like it's not happening. Just confess it. The Bible says confess your faults one to another. Confess your sins to God. The word confess in the Greek is literally translated, watch this, to say it out loud. See, we'll whisper it to ourselves, but you've never got to the point where you say it. I mean, you won't say it out loud. You'll say it to yourself. Confess means that you have to say it out loud. So when you're trying to figure out why you haven't gotten a breakthrough yet, it's because you keep whispering what you should be shouting. I'm jealous.
I'm hard to get along with. I can't be trusted. So you ain't ready. You ain't there yet. But if you're going to heal, you're going to have to confess it. Anything you won't say out loud, you can't get over. I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm confused. Another thing I want you to do as you're healing, I want you to stay creative. See, creativity is a powerful expression. Creativity helps you to increase your self-esteem. It gives you something to win about. And when you win in the area of creativity, it will give you enough joy to supplant and survive the attack that the enemy has prompted on you emotionally. Everybody say, be creative. Let me say it this way. All trauma at its core is a picture. Creativity is the brush. Create. Dream. Draw even if you can't. Just create something. Go get a puzzle. Get some Legos. Just create. Number four. This is huge. Whenever you're not healed, you have to monitor your cravings. Hurt will make you have an appetite for things you're allergic to. Loneliness will have you in a relationship that's over before it starts. And if you don't address that trauma, you will think you are in a relationship. You are actually just in company. How do I know it's just company? Because you can't wait until they leave. Now, when you with somebody you want to be with, they in the bathroom or you on the hill, where you, where you going? You've been in the bathroom too long. Where, where you at? You've been in the kitchen. You've been eating too long. Where you at? When it's just company, you be like, whoo, thank you, Jesus. You don't want to go with your brother now? I know they're going for six months, but it's okay. God left earth for, <laughs> you can leave. Everybody say, monitor your cravings. Don't let hunger and trauma turn you into a starving monster. It'll make you say these dreadful words. This is what comes after trauma. If you've ever said these words, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. After you finish hurting, after you finish crying, after you finish trying to heal, and you know you can heal wrong, if you don't set a bone, it'll heal, but it'll be crooked. This is how you know you have been hurt and you're not over it. Look at me. It's my last sentence before I pray for you. I'm going to just do me. And when you get there, you're done. Because God ain't going to do what he's going to do in your life through you alone. Paul had Timothy. Jesus left off the Holy Spirit. Paul was in prison with Silas. Not the first Adam, but the second Adam. You need help. If you're in this place today, and I've been all in your business, And you feel like I talk to you like a stepchild. But you know it came from the most 
affectionate part of my heart just to see you better. And you know this word was for you. I just want you to stand on your feet. Lift your hands all over this place. We're right back to Daddy. and say I If we could do this on our own, it would be done. We only came today to acknowledge that we know something needs to be done. Simultaneously, we admit that we know that only you can do it. Help us heal tonight. We don't want to go into our 30s the way we came out of our 20s. We don't want to go into our 40s the way we came out of our 30s. We don't want to go into our 50s the way we came out of our 40s. We don't want to go into our 60s the way we came out of our 50s. Creating us a clean heart, renewing us a right spirit. If we don't break this curse, we're going to give it to our sons and our daughters. If we don't break this curse, we're going to raise another reprobate generation. If we don't raise this pain, we're going to be rehearsing stories of yesteryear and not pressing towards the mark for the prize of the upward call. Tonight is the last night that we will cry over what we shed tears about. Stand firm on the fact that you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. We seek you tonight and believe that all things will be well. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him 25 seconds of praise. Come on, give it to him, give it to him. I'm desperate for, I'm desperate for you. Hug somebody and tell them everything's going to be all right. Hug somebody and tell them everything's going to be all right. And I, oh, oh. One more time, come on, come on, sing it like you mean it. Say hi. Hallelujah. It's time to give. It's time to give. Come on and praise God. We're giving church. We believe our giving breaks curses. We believe our giving rebukes the devourer. We believe our giving is the way we communicate with God and God communicates back with us. How many of you know giving works? Let me see some sign if you know giving works. 
And I don't need to be prompt, tricked, primed. I came expecting to leave God a gift. I came knowing that I was going to give because I came expecting to receive. You cannot expect anything out of a relationship you do not deposit into. One of my favorite words in the English language is reciprocity. It means I give to you and you can expect it and you give to me and I can expect it. And when everybody knows that I'm in a relationship that I'm not only sowing into, that I am reaping from, it builds trust. God uses money to build his relationship of trust with you. That's why sometimes he takes it away and then he still provides. Sometimes he gives you an abundance and see if you'll help somebody else or whether you'll be selfish. It's a test. It's a test. This thing is immaterial. It's about what happens in the heart. The stock market controls what this does. God controls what I can do with it. Everybody who got your gift, stand up. We're going to give and we're going home. Anybody glad you came tonight? Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I... pray tonight that as you release this seed that God will rebuke the devourer that all of your bills will be paid by the fifth of every month I wish I had my phone with me today y'all know I've been anointed to erase student debt I got another report today that another person I prophesied to it's in my phone from Dallas when I preached at Bishop's Church Wednesday, $70,000 in student loan debt gone. What that simply means is that since I made that declaration to you, over $6 million in student loan debt has erased. Anybody want to be under that anointing? And God did not tell me to release it. He's still going to erase student debt as you become faithful with your giving. How many of y'all need God to do something with them Fannie Mae, Mac, Larry, Jack, and Jill, all of them. Anybody need God to do something with all of them? I bind every one of them in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout debt free. Debt -free. Pass your gift to my right, your left. Y'all praise God for my